Obesity itself isn't the problem. It's the things that accompany obesity, like the insulin resistance and the hypertension and the elevated cholesterols and all these things that pair with it. And our work shows that there's a biologic switch that turns on all of these events together. Mm -hmm. So it's not that obesity is the culprit. Obesity is just one of the components. Welcome to The Proof Podcast, a space for science-based conversation exploring the health and longevity benefits that come with mastering nutrition, physical exercise, mindfulness, recovery, sleep, and alignment. Facts, nuance, and trustworthy recommendations, minus the hyperbole. Hi friends, great to be here with you. I'm your host, Simon Hill. I'm a qualified physiotherapist and nutritionist with an undergraduate science degree and a master's in the science of human nutrition. Today, I sit down with Dr. Richard Johnson. Dr. Johnson is a professor of medicine at the University of Colorado and is both a clinician, educator, and researcher. For over 20 years, he's led research on the cause of obesity and diabetes with special interest in the role of sugar, especially fructose and uric acid. I caught Dr. Johnson on a number of podcasts recently discussing his theory around why nature wants us to be fat, the title of his new book. While there were certainly a few unresolved questions in this exchange, and perhaps differences in the way that we see things, I really enjoy Dr. Johnson's passion and find his ideas and the general discussion of what's causing us to become progressively more and more overweight an interesting one. And as mentioned towards the end, this is an open conversation. I'd love to have Dr. Johnson back on at any time to focus on some of the questions we didn't resolve. Dr. Johnson, welcome to the show. It's a great, great honor to have this time with you. Uh, It's a great pleasure to be on your show. You've been doing some wonderful work here. As of you, I've been listening to you for a few years now on various shows, uh, most notably on Peter Atiyah's show. And I've read quite a few of your papers and, of course, your new book, which I'm, I'm really uh, excited to kind of dig into and share. There's so much that I feel I can learn from you and our, our community can learn from you. Perhaps here we, we start quite broad with a bit of a history to create some context and then we could zoom in. Can you give folks an idea as to how new or old obesity is? What is the, the sort of earliest evidence of obesity and, and with regards to recent history, at what point did the incidence of obesity begin to sort of pick up pace? Well, obesity has always been around, but it was very, very rare. Uh, And even around 1900, there was a study done of Civil War veterans in the United States, and they followed them every decade. And, and, uh, you know, but in 1880 or so, a 50-year-old man, uh, the, the incidence of prevalence of obesity was about 2%, 1%. And by around 1900, it was around 3%. And then uh, it started to increase gradually. And really, the, the turning point was in the 1890s uh, and early 1900s. And uh, obesity started to increase along with heart disease, hypertension, kidney disease, uh, diabetes. They all tracked together. They were all very rare. Uh, I mean, diabetes was uh, one case in 50,000 people in 1893. You know, that's pretty uncommon. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then it all started to increase sort of um, markedly in the early 1900s. And then there was a sharp inflection point in the U.S. in particular or in the 1970s. And then it just took off. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, today you know, 35, 40% of uh, adults are obese um, in most countries. I mean, there are some countries like uh, Samoa, uh, it's higher. And uh, in some populations like the Pima Indian, um, it's higher. And and, um, Nauru, another island in the Pacific, uh, it's very high. So it can vary uh, Mm -hmm. among populations. But it's it's really become extraordinarily common in the last uh, decades, and it's really affecting children. Now, if you go way back, you can find uh, evidence of obesity in the Maori, um, you know, from graves from the fifteen, uh, you know, from the fifteenth century and thirteenth um, uh, century. 
um, be really before um, Westernization. And, mm -hmm. um, and you can find some obesity among the Pima um, that uh, appeared to occur even before Westernization. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the most part, obesity was extremely rare before the, uh, before the entrance of the Western diet. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, a, a period of time, uh, you know, that I write about, which is when in early humans were living in Europe. Uh, some of the earliest uh, modern humans uh, came into Europe around 40,000 uh, years ago, 45,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And they were the mammoth hunters and they, uh, you know, were, you know, big, big game hunters. Mm -hmm. And they they made a lot of sculptures of obese women where it was very clear that they that they knew what an, what true obesity looked like. And um, and some of them looked pregnant. And it appears that this, you know, we did a study uh, on these uh, figurines and and uh, and made the case that they were actually uh, in response to, uh, you know, harsh conditions uh, in Europe where they there was a period where this, the population fell by two thirds. Mm -hmm. And during that time, the, the ice uh, glaciers, um, you know, actually advanced and there was a loss of a lot of the big game and there was a contraction of the population and the people got a lot shorter. Actually, they got shorter over, a, you know, a 10,000 years <laughs> period. Mm -hmm. And during that time, um, uh, these uh, figurines of obese women show up and, you know, we actually think that they were, um, you know, uh, kind of like an amulet or, you know, uh, uh, to, to represent uh, survival mm -hmm. because to uh, if you were pregnant, uh, you you had to carry extra fat. If, mm -hmm. if, if it was a famine, you would not survive. The baby would not survive unless there was sufficient fat. And so we think that this was a survival symbol. Yeah, and that kind of seems to be a central theme throughout your work. Yeah. That this idea of gaining fat and excessive adiposity, while we see it as a, a, a negative thing, there is a protective element to it within the right context. And mm -hmm. would you say, given the rapid increase in obesity over just the last hundred odd years, that this really points to a change in something around us, a change in our environment as the most likely explanation over, say, large changes in genetics, if, if folks are kind of thinking about that? Yeah, well, very early on, uh, you know, I became very interested in the etiology of obesity, and I was well aware. You know, actually, I'll tell you a trick I do. <laughs> when I try to learn about something, I Google you know, I go to PubMed and I look up all the papers, you know, thousands of papers like on diabetes, and I'll pull up like 40,000 papers. Okay. Now I don't read 40,000 papers, but what I do is I go to the oldest one. <laughs> I go to the one that was published, you know, in 1880, you know, and I look it up and I, then I track down from the references in that paper. And I try to get down to when, when things started. And because I figured that when things start, uh, when it's rare, it's much easier to look for associations than when it's common. If it's if everybody has it, it's very hard to show mm -hmm. what factor it is that associates with it. But when it's rare, uh, it's much easier. And uh, and so that's my trick. And so, you know, um, what I did was I realized that um, obesity really took off in the 20th century. And, um, and there weren't that many generations, uh, you know, that, you know, if you consider a generation, you know, to be about 20 to 25, 30 years, um, you know, there's not enough for a genetic mutation to cause obesity. It's just not, uh, it's too short a time. So for the obesity to go from 3% to 40% and from diabetes from one in 50,000 to uh, one in a uh, one in eight, um, you know, to, to do that in a hundred years means there's something else besides genetic. It has to be environmental, mm -hmm. and so. Um, but interestingly, we did track down genetic mechanisms, and we found that there was a genetic environmental uh, interaction that drove obesity. But 
But um, despite that, uh, you know, uh, really the cause of this huge epidemic is environmental. It's related to Western diet and culture for the vast majority of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I really want to get into that, that relationship interaction between genetics and this switch that you describe whereby in the wrong environment or in a certain environment, rather than it being protective, it can work against us and lead to poor metabolic health. I think it's super interesting. Just while we kind of explore this this idea of obesity at a, at a high level, um, I'm wanting to kind of frame this conversation so we understand what the implications are of excessive adiposity. And there has been a, a little bit of a conversation, I think, uh, recently. Um, there's a, a movement, in fact, called Healthy at Any Size. And given your work is focused on trying to solve obesity, I wondered what you thought about that. Is this sort of idea of, uh, you know, being metabolically healthy at, at any size? Is that an accurate reflection of the science? Do you have any particular view on that? Yes, I do. And I've actually published on this. Uh, so the very first thing to say is that um, obesity itself isn't the problem. It's the things that accompany obesity, like the insulin resistance and the hypertension and the, you know, the elevated cholesterols and all these things that pair with it. And our work showed that um, the biologic, there's a biologic switch that turns on all of these events together. Mm-hmm. So it's not that obesity is the culprit. Obesity is just one of the components. You know, what what we learned uh, from our research was that there's a process that drives obesity, but it's also at the same time driving insulin resistance. It's driving high blood pressure. It's driving a lot of different behaviors. And so most people who are obese will have activated this biologic pathway so that they will have obesity with high blood pressure or with elevated blood pressure, not yet hypertension, or they'll have insulin resistance, but not yet diabetes. So usually that obesity clusters with these other things, but it doesn't mean that obesity causes it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we can dissociate it very easily in animals. I can make a skinny animal diabetic and I can make a, you know, an obese animal. Well, it's harder to make an obese animal not insulin resistant. Mm -hmm. But there are situations where you can do that. Mm -hmm. And so there probably is a healthy obesity. It's not common. uh, But um, and and when I have done paper, when I've done publications on this, and I I write a lot, as you know, um, uh, you know, it's hard to actually prove that a person that healthy obesity exists, because if you do a group of patients where their only abnormality is obesity and you follow them for 20 years, many of them will develop other Mm -hmm. of these features. So, um, but, but it's not the, the message I would like to give is it's not the obesity. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. It's the, it's the factors that like to go along with it. There's and and obesity is not by itself a bad thing. One of the um, things that I've learned uh, is that mild weight, uh, being mildly overweight is actually associated with a longer survival mm-hmm. in, in humans. Um, and so, for example, if you have a BMI of 27 and you're 70 years old, that's actually associated with a longer lifespan. Mm. Likewise, if you have cancer or any kind of serious condition, having a little extra fat actually is associated with better survival. Hmm. Now, uh, you know, I don't really recommend you to have a BMI of 27 uh, when you're 20 years old because you don't need it. But, you know, as uh, but if you got, had a serious illness like COVID, uh, you might uh, having a little bit of weight gain might be might or a little bit of extra fat might be good. Now, in COVID, if you're really obese, um, it was associated with worse mortality, but it was because of of the fact that most people with obesity show some evidence of systemic inflammation and that combination is a mm-hmm. problem. But do you think that the, the, the slightly higher BMI being somewhat protective when we see that association could, could be explained by 
the protective effect of having greater lean muscle as well? Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, when you do activate the switch, you upregulate the uh, innate immune response. And so th- theoretically, that could help you a little bit with certain infections. However, if you upregulate it too much, then you have systemic inflammation and then you can make things worse. Mm-hmm. Um, and we actually did a, some studies in COVID patients, for example, and we found that, you know, obesity and especially a high systemic uric acid was associated with an increased risk for mortality from COVID. And most patients, as you probably know, people who are overweight and diabetic uh, were at higher risk for COVID. And we think it was because of this. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, interestingly, the high uric acid is part of this biologic switch that activates this, uh, this process. So, but um, you know, I'm sure, Simon, you know that um, there's all these studies that say that caloric restriction is associated with living longer. So you probably want to say to me, well, come on, Rick, how, why is it, you know, that being a little overweight is actually associated with better lifespan uh, for us when if you're a mouse and I reduce, you know, do caloric restriction by 30%, you're going to live a lot longer. And, um, and the trick to that Do you want me to explain that? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. So the trick to that is that um, to make fat requires um, the generation of oxidative stress. You really can't make fat or store fat without uh, inducing a little bit of oxidative stress to your mitochondria. And when that happens, it's, uh, you know, oxidative stress is, is, is sort of like a sunburn. It's sort of like, um, you know, smoking and getting these oxidants and they're, they're, it's not really a good thing. But w- what we do is we, w- when we try to store fat, we actually stun the energy factories in our body by creating a little bit of oxidative stress. Initially, it's completely reversible. Mm-hmm. Um, but what happens is um, over time, that oxidative stress can cause wear and tear of our energy factories and it leads to old age and death eventually okay so the if you keep trying to activate this process and animals in the wild like to have some extra fat around and all of us want to have some extra fat around because we got we got to protect ourselves when there's no food Mm -hmm. so all of us try to store a little bit of extra fat every every animal does and so we're always spending a little bit of oxidative stress to generate and say and store some fat. So now if I'm doing it, if I'm a uh, experimentalist and I say, okay, I want these animals to live long, how can I reduce the oxidative stress to those energy factories? Well, I'm going to do it by fasting them and keeping their, their, their body fat low. Mm-hmm. And by keeping their body fat low, the mitochondria are going to last longer. The animal is going to live longer. Bingo. But if you take that animal that has no fat, and you, you know, what you're doing in the lab is you're feeding them every day. There's no stress. They're getting maybe 70% of what they normally eat, but there, there's no, you're not fasting them for two weeks because, you know, a drought came or something. But if you take that animal with no fat and you put it in the wild, it's not going to survive because it needs some fat mm-hmm. for survival. So the, you know, in our society, if you can keep a BMI of 22, you're probably going to live longer than if you have a BMI of 27 because you can get food every day. You know, you can always mm-hmm. go down to the grocery store. And, and the only danger, you won't have much danger with the BMI of 22, but if you take your BMI to, um, to 17 and you have no fat stores, the only danger is like if you get an infection, mm-hmm. you could get into trouble quickly. So, um, so it, it's all about, you know, Knowing the science can help you figure out how mm-hmm. things are working. And, uh, yes, if you, you know, if the people who are skinny tend to age slower, that's probably true. Um, but if you have a little extra fat and you have cancer, that's probably going to help you. Mm. So it's, yeah, that's uh, super it just interesting. Depends. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you. And, and so it is possible to be metabolically healthy and be a little bit overweight or even obese. But as you said, that is often, that could be transient. You know, something that comes to mind here that 
uh, I read about a lot. What about this concept of the importance or the sort of degree of risk being determined by where you store that fat? So whether you're someone that stores more fat subcutaneously versus, say, visceral fat, does does that uh, affect the the kind of the risk that we would or wouldn't see with someone who is carrying a bit of extra weight? Yeah, you're exactly right. So visceral fat is is part of the switch, this biologic switch. And so when you activate the switch, it tends to put fat in our adipose tissues, visceral. It puts it in our liver. Uh, it increases it in our blood. And, uh, and a lot of people who have more metabolically healthy fat tend to have it uh, distributed other sites. It's not so much abdominal. You know, it's, uh, they, they used to call it the apple and the pear. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, figure, figuration, but, um, but basically a subcutaneous, uh, fat is thought to be pretty safe, pretty, uh, healthy. Brown fat, of course, is healthy. Um, and is that, is that a, a genetic thing where some people just genetically are more likely to store fat in this subcutaneous area where it, has less of an effect on metabolic health, whereas others are more likely to develop visceral fat? Uh, there probably are genetic causes. <laughs> there's, you know, there's usually a genetic mechanism with almost everything, but it's probably not the common mechanism. The mm-hmm. common mechanism is that um, if you activate this biologic switch that we were studying, uh, it will try, tend to make visceral fat. Mm -hmm. And if you try to increase the fat other ways, it will be more likely subcutaneous, I believe. And, um, and, you know, a a good example was a paper published uh, by, by Peter Havel's group where they were uh, comparing uh, two different carbohydrates uh, and fructose, which turns out to be the primary mechanism for activating the switch caused more uh, visceral fat. And glucose caused more subcutaneous fat, mm-hmm. and uh, and there uh, we we did some. Actually, I did a study uh, that I can talk about, but we I'm getting ahead of myself because yeah, we really haven't quickly. talked. Well, we, we haven't talked about the biological no, switch. No, I think we rewind. We touch on the biological switch, and then we come to fructose, uh, uric acid, and just the the switch yeah. in general and what it means for for our health yeah. and for our food choices. So. The core of your thesis, if I'm interpreting your work correctly, is this idea that humans have developed a biological system. It involves a a fat switch, as you describe it, that in years gone by has helped us survive during periods of famine. But today, in this environment of of food abundance, it can work against us. And, And so we have this uh, we're left with this kind of mismatch between our biology and the current environment, and that can backfire on us and lead to metabolic dysregulation, diabetes, fatty liver disease, etc. So perhaps you could explain this at a high level and how this view differs from the views of others, your peers, your colleagues who are researching obesity and then we can dig into some of the specifics of the animal and, and human studies in a bit more detail. Yeah. So uh, when I came into this field, uh, there were basically two major uh, hypotheses for what could cause obesity. There were basically two major hypotheses uh, for what causes obesity. And one was kind of like the energy balance hypothesis. And that basically says that... Um, you know, we, we're, uh, victims of our own success. And what's happened is that we've become so effective at getting, make, um, cultivating, uh, crops and getting foods and that we have our, our grocery stores are totally filled with all kinds of foods. And we've learned how to reduce the, our exercise, uh, needs so we can drive a car there. We can, ride a bike, but, you know, we don't have to walk, we can, uh, and so forth. And so uh, in this hypothesis, the problem is, is that we're eating too much and exercising too little. 
And it's really driven by um, our culture. And, uh, you know, the TV is so good that we're sitting there and watching it. And the ads are so good that they're draw drawing you into the restaurants. And uh, it's just natural to, to eat things that taste good. So we're going to keep eating it. And uh, and we're going to get fat because it's the law of thermodynamics. Uh, too much calories in, too little spent, and the rest gets stored as fat. And this has been the main hypothesis. Um, and it's... Uh, sometimes called the overnutrition hypothesis or the energy balance hypothesis. And it puts the blame on the culture, puts the blame on, on us. It's, you know, you're bad that you, why can't you control your food? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and we've, I can really debunk the, this, this idea that it's that. Um, but before I do, um, the second major hypothesis came from this big discovery that a carb restriction seems to be dramatic at its ability to um, cause weight loss and compared to just caloric restriction. And if you, um, if you do carb restriction, you don't even have to do caloric restriction because you just reduce how much you eat mm. and you start uh, losing weight and these keto diets. And, and so the thought was, well, how is it that carbs are causing obesity? And the theory is that the carbs uh, contain glucose, which is a, you know, breakdown to glucose. Glucose is the main simple sugar in our blood. And glucose stimulates the hormone insulin. And when the insulin levels go up, it stimulates glucose uptake into muscle and into uh, tissues like the liver and other. And then the, the, uh, the, uh, the glucose is basically converted into fat. And so it's a, it's sort of the insulin hypothesis and we need to, and, and these were the two main ones. Can I ask you a couple of questions sure. on that? Just quickly. I know we're moving at a great pace here. I've had, uh, Dr. Christopher Gardner on my show. Uh, I know you'll be familiar with him from Stanford. Um, and I've read some of Kevin Hall's work and I'm just trying to kind of reconcile this. And I am, I'm aware that people listening may also be aware of their work. And so a couple of studies come to mind. The diet fit study where Christopher Gardner was looking at a kind of free living 12 month randomized controlled trial of, uh, low carb versus high carb. Well, that was the intention. Um, and, and sort of set out to do this in a way where the diets were high, uh, diet quality rather than, than having kind of more of the process style diets and, the, the aggregate, there didn't seem to be a difference with regards to the low carb versus the high carb, um, intervention. And within each group, there were some people that did well and some that did not so well, but the overall, the mean, there was no statistical, um, significant difference between the mean. And then Kevin Hall's work in metabolic wards, which are a bit more short term and probably less generalizable, but He's, he's also looked at like a keto diet versus a high carb diet. Again, high quality diets. And there didn't seem to be significant differences in, in body weight. So I'm just wondering how we reconcile that, um, with sort of where you're going, uh, with your current yeah. train of thought here. Well, Simon, I've, I'm going to have to tell you how our pathway works because it explains all these studies. And, uh, and, and so the problem is, is actually, uh, understanding the science. And once the science is understood, then you certainly, then it, it seems to explain these uh, disparate uh, hypotheses. Mm -hmm. But anyway, th those two main, were the two main hypotheses. And they're, and they're working, think about it this way, they're working from looking at people with obesity as if it's a disease, and they're working backwards. They're saying, okay, obesity is a health issue. It's a problem. What's causing it? And they're taking this condition and they're going backwards to try to figure out what causes it with the idea being that it's really a, uh, a pro, you know, a disease process. Now, what we wanted to do was to actually think about how nature views it. And, uh, being fat is actually associated with survival out in the wild. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, if you get too fat, you're going to get eaten by a predator for sure because you can't <laughs> escape. But there, there are animals that will purposely become obese at certain times of the year to survive. And, and here they are 
purposely trying to get fat. So if you think about it that way, you know, here, we are not trying to get fat, but if an animal is trying to get fat, how do they do it? And mm -hmm. what is the mechanism? And so, uh, you know, when you think about it, in, and there were these beautiful studies done years ago where they took animals in the, you know, in the wild or animals and, the, and they would like uh, force feed them to make them gain weight or they would uh, fast them to make them lose weight. But then as soon as they stopped, you know, manipulating them, those animals would go back to the weight they wanted to be. They would go back to the perfect weight they are that they wanted to be at that time of the year. You know, it's like uncanny. Normally, animals regulate their weight. And there's some data from the early 50s and 60s that suggests that humans also tended to want to regulate their weight. And you know it, Simon, you know it, that when you were young, uh, and you probably still are young, but when you were really young, it was like hard to gain weight. You could eat all you want one day, and the next day, yeah, your weight may go up one pound or something, but you know, within a couple of days, you're back at that weight. You know, we try, you know, for a long time, we regulate our weight and then something went wrong in our thirties or forties. And sometimes it's younger and sometimes it's later, but a lot of people start to lose their ability to regulate their weight. But animals in the wild, they regulate their weight beautifully. And then in the fall, like a bear will prepare for hibernation. And there's actually, you know, we think of hibernation, they're going to take, go to bed, fall asleep and for four months and burn their fat, but they have to build the fat first. Mm -hmm. And so there's this period in the fall before they hibernate where suddenly they change. And instead of eating, you know, 4,000 calories a day, it's eating, you know, 10,000 calories a day or 20,000 calories a day. And these, these animals, uh, can, can actually gain eight or 10 pounds a day, these bears. And they, they actually, they slow their metabolism, especially when they're resting, but not so much when they're foraging. And they, they forage for food. They slow their resting metabolism. They're eating twice as much. They're storing it as fat. They become insulin resistant. Think about that. Pre-diabetic. Mm -hmm. They put, fat in their liver, they put fat in their blood, they are developing the metabolic syndrome and it's all one big set of events. And then then, and then, and at some point when the food starts being less available because it's getting colder and colder, they drop their body temperatures, go into a den and they hibernate for four months. They don't pee, they don't eat, they slow their metabolism and they live by burning their fat Mm -hmm. uh, and then in the spring, after the fat is almost gone, they wake up, go out, and then they're back to normal, regulating their weight just beautifully. And this is true not just for hibernating animals. It's true for um, birds that do long-distance migration, nesting birds. Uh, it's, done, it's, it's seen in, you know, in, in warm climates, too. There are mm -hmm. animals that hibernate. Uh, they call it estivation, but, uh, you know, like the, there's a lemur that will, um, store its fat in its tail and it will sleep in tree hollows for like three months living off its fat. And a very interesting thing is that the fat doesn't just provide calories because when you burn fat, you make energy or, you know, so it's a way of, it's a stored energy. So it's stored energy. So when you don't have food, you need energy. And so the, Fat becomes that stored energy that you can release energy from. And, but what it doesn't just release energy, it releases water. And these, uh, these animals will actually get water from their fat. And that's, uh, camels have fat in their hump and they use the, the fat as a source of water when they need it. Uh, and whales don't drink, uh, seawater. And so they get a lot of their water from the food they eat, but they get about a third of it from the fat that they burn. That's why whales, one reason why whales are so fat. Okay. So let's, let's unpack this. So you, yeah. there's these, these, these animals, when they're approaching winter or period of famine or, or starvation, there appears to be this process whereby they are eating more calories, they become insulin resistant, they store more fat, 
fat in the liver. And this, the, the, the hypothesis at this stage when you're observing this is that this is protective. There's something happening biologically that is uh, promoting this. And you would then wanted to piece that together and look at, well, what are those biological mechanisms that are right. at play here? That's right. So actually, I'm going to break it down and say they, they're, one is a behavioral response. They start foraging for food. And foraging is a real process where you have to be ready to go into areas you've never been. You have to be exploratory. You have to make quick decisions. It's a change in behavior from a normal animal. You're When you're foraging, you are searching for food and you won't give up because you the more food and, and you'll, when you find it, you're going to eat as much as you can and you keep going. So that's behavior one. The second thing is there's a hunger. These animals will stay hungry even after they eat a huge amount of food. They'll stay thirsty even after they drink a lot of water. They will stay, they will also st- uh, become insulin resistant. And when, when I say that, you know, say, well, why would they become insulin resistant? And remember that we, that we have this glucose circulating in our blood. The glucose is circulating in our blood and, uh, and we use it insulin to put it into the skeletal muscle, to put it in the liver and to put it in other sites. Okay. And so what happens is when you become insulin def- resistant, it's harder to put that glucose into the muscle. So the muscle doesn't get as much. So it's burning less. So that helps reduce the metabolism, right? So it's conserving energy. The muscles aren't burning the glucose. They're having to, to survive with less fuel. But that's okay because what the animal wants is really to maintain glucose to the brain because it's the brain that counts. When you're starving, you've got to be able to think straight. And so the insulin resistance has a tendency to keep the glucose levels high and the tissues that use insulin tend to be like the muscle, whereas the, most of the brain doesn't require insulin. And so uh, when the glucose levels go up, it's like providing that safety valve for mm-hmm. the for the brain. So insulin resistance is a survival thing. And animals that starve and so forth, not only will they drop their insulin levels, but they'll become insulin resistant because, you know, you, you try to conserve the glucose you have for for the brain. So anyway, so uh, what happens is and they raise their blood pressure and, uh, you know, that helps maintain the circulation. So all these things are like a survival response. And, they, and then the question was, OK, if these animals are having a coordinated process where they're trying to survive, what's triggering the, them to gain weight? And, you know, to me, this was even more important than what triggers them to, to hibernate. And uh, mm-hmm. because if I could figure if we could figure out what's triggering them to gain weight, then we might get a clue for why everyone's becoming obese. Mm-hmm. You know, not everyone, but a lot of a lot of us have had trouble with weight gain in our lives. So let's and, dive uh, into to yeah. kind of ha- how you piece that together. And I think of particular interest is how have you been able to tease apart the effect that a particular compound, uh, I'm thinking of fructose here, has on this uh, this switch that you describe versus an excess of calories because as I'm hearing what you're describing, these animals are eating a lot of calories. So, and, and I know that some of the, the sort of pushback that I've seen on, on this model is that, well, how do we know it's actually fructose independently versus just overconsumption of calories? Yeah. So I'll tell you how we did it. And then I'm going to, we can actually use this as an opportunity to point out, you know, how this can explain, you know, some of these papers that you've been mm-hmm. talking about, because this is the, the clue. What you're talking about is, you know, when you understand how that works, then you can kind of, suddenly go, aha, that's why that study showed that. So, so the question was, what triggers the switch? And we uh, had independently been doing some work where we were looking at a substance called uric acid. And we had found that, uh, that uh, uric acid is a substance that, uh, it, it, first off, it's a substance that everybody has. We all have it. We make it. 
and we have to get rid of it. So uh, most of the we get rid of, we get rid of through the urine. Uh, and so we make uric acid and we excrete it in the urine. Some of it we excrete in our gut and we make it from uh, foods. We can, we, you know, there's certain foods that will make uric acid or, or there are certain foods that when we eat them, we will make uric acid and then we have to get rid of it. And we can also make uric acid when 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 uh, things start breaking down in our body. So if our, if our muscles are breaking down, they will generate uric acid. Uh, if, if energy is broken down, it also generates uric acid. So uric acid kind of comes from what we call the nuclear nucleotides, these substances that are used to make DNA and RNA. And, you know, our genes are made of, of nucleic acids. And when they break down, you know, when a cell breaks down, the nucleus contains these substances and, and they start make, to, they're turned into uric acid and then we get rid of it. Now, uh, people know about uric acid, not because they know that it's, uh, comes from DNA and RNA, hmm. but, but because, uh, there's a very common disease associated with a high uric acid. And that disease is called gout. Mm-hmm. And gout is this arthritis, uh, that typically affects men, but women get it too. And, uh, it's, it's this in- inflammation of a joint that's really painful. It gets hot and red. And uric acid crystallizes into the joint. So uric acid is not very soluble. And if the concentrations get very high in our blood, they can crystallize and they tend to crystallize into the joints where they cause this really terrible inflammation. And and the classic is in the big toe. And what's interesting is uh, gout, like in our country, in the U.S., it affects like 9 million people. Uh, And so it's a pretty common disease. Uh, but it's, uh, it, you know, so it's common in almost every country, but it's, uh, particularly associated with, uh, alcohol, alcohol, mm-hmm. uh, with rich, uh, purine, rich foods, typically meats, processed, processed red meats in particular, like bacon and things like that, ham. Uh, and it's also, uh, you know, common with, with shellfish, uh, gravies, uh, Yeast, yeast extract, you know, has a lot of DNA in there. And so, uh, you know, like the yeast extract in beers, beers famous mm-hmm. for precipitating gout. And then interesting, there's another substance that can raise uric acid. And that's a, a one carbohydrate. And that carbohydrate is fructose. And it's the only carbohydrate that uh, really generates uric acid to any significant degree. I mean, there are others, but you know, they're kind of like unique little rare things, but, but fructose is, uh, you know, it's present in fruit, which we think of as healthy. Uh, it's present in honey, which we love. Um, but when fructose is ingested, it, uh, it consumes energy. Uh, energy is consumed acutely. So normally when you eat a calorie, normally when you eat a, a food, you make energy and that energy we call ATP. Uh, and it, you, most of it is made in our energy factories or mitochondria. And so we're making energy all the time and we use it to do everything we do. And, uh, but when you eat fructose, uh, it consumes energy before it makes energy. And it consumes it much more rapidly than any other food. So all foods you do consume energy, but they, there's, you know, regulation and energy levels never fall. You know, they just don't fall if you eat, uh, you know, carbs uh, other than fructose. But when you eat, when you eat fructose, those, the fructose causes this ATP consumption and it triggers a reaction to make uric acid because when the ATP breaks down, it's turned into uric acid. And the tricky part is that when uric acid is inside a cell, it causes that oxidative stress that I talked about to those mitochondria that makes fat. So it actually starts to, uh, re- what it does is that instead of your, your food being turned into ATP, which is like instant energy, it's turned into stored energy, which is fat. The balance, the energy balance is still there, Simon. You know, the, the, it's, uh, you're making less ATP, 
but you're making more fat and both are energy sources. Mm -hmm. So energy conservation occurs. But what happens is you're making your energy levels are lower in the cell. The ATP levels are lower. So what drop you, the energy we're using becomes low and the energy instead is being stored mm -hmm. as fat where, where we don't see it. And okay, it's let fine. Me, if, yeah. Let me summarize a, a couple of things. Yes, we'll take a absolutely. pause and then we'll keep going because I have a lot of questions here. So what you're saying there is en energy balance is still maintained. It's just that the you know all of these nutrients that we're ingesting our macronutrients carry a certain amount of energy you're saying that it is preferentially when it's coming through fructose which i want to double back and differentiate between other sugars yeah. um but when it's coming through fructose rather than being used to produce atp it's been shuttled down another pathway which sees it being stored still as energy but in the form of body fat that's right. And okay. then here's, here's, uh, here's the trick. I'll just throw this out. So when, when the uh, ATP levels are low, that tends to cause a little bit more hunger. So the, when the, the body responds to a low ATP in the liver in particular by, by stimulating a little bit of hunger, that makes you want to eat more. So animals, when they eat fructose, they tend to want to eat a little more, even acutely. But what's really cool and, and very important, because we're going to talk about this later with the, you know, to explain a lot of these mysteries, um, is that for the most part, when you eat fructose, you, although you may be a little bit hungrier initially, you don't really increase the total amount of energy, you still regulate your energy for the first few weeks. So maybe even, a, you know, for some animals, it's a two weeks for some animals, it's a month. And, and probably for us, it's probably six weeks or so. So if I put you on a, let's say I put you on a high fructose diet, you're going to be uh, converting most of the energy I give you into fat. Yes. But, um, but you aren't going to necessarily eat more food for the first, you know, number of weeks because what we, our studies show that it takes a, you know, a few weeks to four weeks, five weeks for the animal to become, uh, chronically hungry. And mm -hmm. what happens is they become resistant to a har hormone called leptin. And leptin is this uh, hormone that's released from the fat. And pretty much tells us when we're full. And, um, and normally it helps keep us uh, from eating too much. Mm -hmm. And when you first start eating sugar, you tend to not be leptin resistant. It takes a while to become leptin resistance. And once you're leptin resistance, then you're going to eat more than you should. And so, uh, you're going to eat a lot more. And at the same time, you're shunting most of those calories to fat compared to ATP. So uh, eventually you're, you're, you're eating a lot more than you normally do. So you're now eat, you know, so what happens is when you go to the restaurant and there's a plate of food put in front of you, you'll, uh, you may still be hungry when you're done. So you want more. So they, the, the people in the restaurant respond by giving you a bigger plate of food. Or they make it a smorgasbord where you can go, or um, you know, a buffet where you can go back and get a second helping. Uh, and they, you know, if you drink, if you get, you're still thirsty after you drink that soft drink. So uh, they, you know, they they give you another one, and and so they're they're responding to your biology as opposed to you to you just wanting more. Your body is saying you're still hungry, and that's because of this biologic switch. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of things here I want to clarify. Yeah. Um, firstly, and forgive me if we're going back to the basics, but yeah, no, um, it's good. I think it's important for us to kind of make sense of all of this. So the first thing that I, I want to, that seems important is why the, the body utilizes more energy when metabolizing fructose uh, over say other sugars. Um, because that seems like that's an important thing. You're saying that that is in part helping drive hunger. And then the second 
thing that I just want to double back on is that it seems like um, a lot of this metabolic dysfunction is driven by an increase in uric acid, both through fructose metabolism, but also through these purine-rich foods in the diet. And you yeah. mentioned some of those being like uh, processed meats and I think yeah. certain certain organs and yeah. alcohol, um, et cetera. Yeah. So I'd like to really clarify what what it is about uric acid as a compound that leads to kind of to to metabolic dysfunction. So those two things. Firstly, fructose and its metabolism, how it's different to say glucose. And then let's zoom in a bit on uric acid. Yeah. So uh when you know when fructose is ingested, there's this consumption of ATP, this energy, ATP. And when the ATP is consumed, it's broken down to uric acid. And so you generate uric acid from the breakdown of ATP. But then the uric acid maintains a low energy in the cell because it causes oxidative stress to those mitochondria. And so it suppresses the mitochondria or energy factories from making more ATP. So now what's happened is uh, instead of making ATP, you're, you're preferentially shunting the calories to fat. And this is how uric acid's working. Uric acid also blocks the regeneration of ATP from, um, you know, by blocking this, uh, you know, an enzyme called AMP kinase. So there, there's this whole thing where uric acid is acting to lower the energy in the cell. That's how it seems to be working. So uric acid is very important. And if you raise uric acid other ways, such as by uh, like drinking beer, you can also activate this switch and you'll get what's called the beer belly. Your blood pressure is going to go up. Your triglycerides are going to go up. You're going to get fatty liver. It's really the same process. And we've been able to, uh, in animals, make them obese by just giving, raising their uric acid other ways. But fructose is the main way we do it. And, uh, and, and a lot of animals rely on fructose as the way they do it. And so like the bear will eat huge amounts of fruit. So not like uh, one or two fruit that we're eating, that's not enough, um, but they're eating tons of fruit. And that fruit uh, provides a lot of fructose, which is then uh, causes this intra, this uric acid to be made inside the cell, activate the switch. Um, and so uh, you can see this with, um, you know, a lot of animals will eat large amounts of fruit. There's even a fish that eats ripe fruit that falls from the trees in the Amazon. And it will eat so much fruit and fructose that it will develop very severe fatty liver that it will survive on uh, when the foods, when the, you know, fruit trees quit fruiting and, uh, and the food gets more scarce and the, the, these guys prefer mm -hmm. fruit. So anyway, so, uh, so fructose is distinct from glucose and mm -hmm. other carbs and most other foods in that it doesn't, you know, most carbs do not generate uric acid. So glucose, when it's just metabolized like glucose, it doesn't um, produce uh, uric acid. Uh, and so it's this, it's specifically the fructose that seems to activate the switch or the uric acid from it. And so, um, so that's more or less the first question. And then, and then what happens is if you give fructose to an animal, they norm, they regulate their weight for the first month, you know, and, and, and they're eating more. They're hungry. They eat more, but they, they, they're able to burn it off a little bit. But after about a month, they become leptin resistant. And when that happens, they suddenly become fat and they'll become fat, mm. diabetic, the whole works from the fructose. So is that, uh, I'm assuming that's why the short-term studies right. where you see a study that's conducted over eight days or two weeks or three weeks, you don't put too much stock in those right. you're looking for, for a longer. So that makes sense. Um, I think that that uh, well, is, okay. is something that uh, most people can kind of uh, make sense of. But what then, about some of the longer term trials? Well, well, well the, one of the most important issues is a question you raised earlier, which is, is the obesity simply from eating too much 
Mm -hmm. Or is there a non-caloric pathway in t as, t as well? So when we saw that animals were getting obese, they were clearly eating more food, right? They were eating a lot more food than they should. And that's also what we see in the wild. When an animal wants to gain weight, it will eat a lot more food and it's slowing its energy metabolism. It's following the energy balance story beautifully. You know, they drop their resting energy metabolism, they're eating more, they're gaining weight. It seems like energy balance is it, okay? So, but here's the trick. The trick is that they're gaining the weight because they've become leptin resistant from the fructose. If they didn't, if they weren't leptin resistant, they would be regulating their weight. They'd be eating more, but spending more energy, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so the question is, you know, so to, to look at that, the way we figured this out was we said, okay, I'm going to take, I'm going to give fructose to this guy and I'm going to give, uh, fructose to this guy. Um, and, and, uh, uh and I'm going to give starch or some other food to this, these other guys. And what are we're going to um, are these animal studies or human studies? At these this are stage? Uh, we're going to talk about animal studies first. Okay, okay, let's do that. And so what we did is we we did a thing called pair feeding, and pair feeding means everybody gets the same amount of calories. That's it. You know, you're only going to get the same amount as what the guy next to you gets. Mm -hmm. And the way you do that experiment is you take your 30 animals, and 15 are going to get sugar, or 15 are going to get fructose. And 15 are going to get something else. And I should mention that fructose isn't just in fruit. It's in table sugar. And it's also in high fructose corn syrup. So the main sources of fructose for us are not fruits. Mm -hmm. It's the sugar that we're eating that has the fructose. And that makes up the major part. And it's the sugar intake in the last century that correlates with this rise in obesity. Okay. So anyway, so. Sugar is the source of fructose for most of us, not the three, two fruit we're eating a day or whatever. It's just not. Okay. So, uh, well, most, most people aren't eating enough or, or anywhere near the recommendations of fruit anyway. Yeah. So I, I love fruit and we can talk <laughs> about fruit and we've done studies with fruit yeah. and fruit is healthy. Okay. But if you eat a hundred fruit, that ain't healthy. Mm -hmm. That's not healthy. If you drink yeah. a lot of fruit juice, you, you could get into trouble because you're going to get a lot of fructose. Uh, it may taste good though, but yeah, you know. <laughs> I want to, I want to, I want to put a pin in that because I want to ask you about, uh, yeah. fruitarians who yeah. seem, seem to be drinking a lot of fruit juice and, and not don't gaining, seem weight. To be, and, yeah, and well, not gaining weight. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Okay. But okay. before we do, I got to get through this thing about the weight gain. Okay. So what we did was we took all these rats and remember, uh, Everybody has to eat the same. So if there's one guy that's eating very little, all the other guys have to eat little. So you, you do is every day you go and you measure how much food each guy eats. And if the, if the, the one who eats the least, that's mm -hmm. how much food the guys all get that night, you know, so. Mm -hmm. And just so, to clarify for folks listening, that's because you want to look at the, you're looking at the independent effects of fructose here as opposed to calories. Right. So when we, we've done this study, you know, umpty ump times, many, many, many times. And, um, and we always get the same finding. And here's what we find. We find that when the animals are all eating the same, weight gain is almost identical among all the animals. Uh, so if I give fructose to these guys and I give cardboard to these guys, but if it's the same amount of calories and they all eating the same, they're all going to gain about the same weight. There is a subtle difference. The subtle difference is that fructose drops the energy metabolism at rest. And so over a long period of time, the, the fructose group burns less calories. So like over a nine months or a year, you're going to see a difference. But like if we did a study and even at five months, there's a trend, but it's not a difference. Mm -hmm. And that's because the change in energy metabolism is, is something that you see over months to years. And what drives acute weight gain is really how many calories you're eating. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's calories that drive weight gain. When you eat fructose though, you're hungry. So you eat more. 
So you gain weight because you're eating more. Now, if I do, if I make everybody in a study eat exactly the same number of calories, I'm not going to show a difference between fructose and cardboard. Okay. Not in a short term study. Hmm. If we, everybody's eating the same amount, there's no difference in weight. However, it isn't just weight gain that happens with a switch. There's changes in body composition. Fat mm-hmm. starts to accumulate in the liver. Fat starts to accumulate in the gut. Fat, fat, you know, you can convert muscle to fat, right? You can convert proteins to fat. You can become insulin resistant. You can become diabetic. You can become hypertensive. And all the other parts of the switch are still turned on. The switch is turned on. So if you give the animals the same amount of calories, it's the fructose group that will develop. They still get metabolic syndrome. They get ob- they get fat. They get fatty liver. They get diabetic. And in one study we did, we unfortunately, one of our animals had cancer. And we didn't know it. So everybody was eating almost nothing because this guy with cancer couldn't eat a lot. And everybody had to eat the same amount as him. And yet the sugar fed rats that were on a starvation type diet all became diabetic. They all developed severe fatty liver. I mean, they had metabolic syndrome. They didn't gain weight. They weren't fat. Mm. It's not the fat that's the problem. It's these other things that, you know, that are causing the problems, the liver disease, the kidney disease, the hypertension, the inflammation. That's independent. Mm. So when the sugar industry, does a study and they say, hey, you know, sugar safe because we did it. We compared the 450 studies in the literature where everybody was fed the same amount and the sugar fed people, um, they and, and the uh, high fat people, you know, we gave them this, exactly the same number of calories. And at the end of the three months, there's no change difference in weight. Right. There shouldn't be. Mm. That's energy balance. I mean, the the sugar one might over a year show a little higher weight, sure. But, you know, it's always the short And that's because of uh, a change in, you're saying that you would predict that because of a change in metabolism. But they they won't tell you what happened to their insulin resistance. They won't tell you what happened to the blood pressure. They won't Mm. tell you what happened to the fat in their liver. They won't tell you all those Mm. other things, okay? So that's that's one, that's one famous trick. Let me summarize a couple of things here. This is super interesting. So you're saying that that energy balance still does exist, oh, but yeah. the problem with these trials where calories are controlled is that you're not seeing the the appetite enhancing effect that fructose can have. So that's the first part of the switch that you could only see in an ad libitum study um, where subjects are allowed to eat as much food as they want. So that's the first thing. And second, you're saying is that independent of, the, of that, that ex- excessive calorie consumption, fructose through this switch will affect various um, metabolic uh, or aspects of metabolic health like insulin resistance through, through the body. Um, so the first thing that I think of here, Richard, is Herman Ponce's work with the Hadza. With the, and, oh yeah, oh yeah. We'll get to right. Hazda. I can talk about them. Do you want me to do that? I can do that right now. But uh, yeah. So, so the, the reason they come to mind is Herman's been on the show, and he he seems to have spent a fair bit of time with the Hadza. Not seems he has, and has done his best to document what they eat, and they seem to be lean and metabolically healthy uh, individuals. And I think. There's a chart in his book and over sort of six or seven months of the year, these these guys and women are eating a tremendous amount of honey. Right. I think some months up to 50%, which is oh, right. a, a, a lot of fructose, but they're right. lean and they seem to be metabolically healthy. So help help us make sense of that. Okay. So when the meat, okay. Uh, I can explain this. I'm trying to figure out if I want to do talk about the genetics behind it, but, uh, but let's not do that right, right now. But here, here would be my explanation. Um, this is a survival pathway. So this fructose pathway is meant to help an animal, uh, have sufficient fat stores to survive. Okay. So if you are, 
uh, out and living in the wild and food is not so easy to find. Uh, you may have to do things to try to keep your fat stores maximal. And the way to do that uh, is to try to find sources of fructose. And what happens is they are eating a lot of honey. Mm -hmm. And the honey, you can tell it's fr the fructose that they're eating it because they get terrible caries. Mm -hmm. And they, their their teeth just rot sure. because the the fructose and the honey is used by the streptococcus that causes cavities. And what the the streptococcus does is this little bacteria lives on fructose, and when when they eat the honey, it will eat it will survive on the honey, and then it will store the honey as a, as a fructose polymer in the in the teeth crevices, and then between what, when the person's not eating, it will survive. The bacteria survive like in a starvation state. They'll go and they'll uh, retrieve the fructose polymers and survive. And in the process of doing this, they cause this inflammation in cavities. So anyway, so we know that the cavities are a sign that the guy's eating a lot of fructose. And we also know that they have a very unique finding. They, they are foraging all the time. And remember, fructose stimulates foraging. These guys uh, march many, many miles a day looking for food. And yet, at the end of the day, when you measure their total energy expenditure, it's not very high. And that's because they drop their resting energy metabolism. That is a fructose-driven mechanism. So what's actually happening is they are in balance because of the fructose they're eating. If there was no honey, they would actually be in trouble. Mm -hmm. They're they're holding, they're holding. They've actually activated the switch. Mm. Would you expect now, them to have more liver fat as well, and to to have any signs of metabolic dysfunction? It just depends. It just depends uh, how how significant their issue is. So, for example, like there are, um, we've identified a similar type of thing going on. Uh, in people working in the sugarcane fields where um, mm -hmm. they're working so hard to, that they're not fat, yet you can find some evidence of, of activation of the switch in these guys. Mm -hmm. But anyway, but, but, but I want to get back to a really central thing that will help resolve a lot of these uh, studies you're talking about. And that is that fructose is the kind of lights the switch, but it's not the big high energy calorie that drives weight gain, right? So if it makes you hungry, but it's only four calories per gram. So you'd have to eat a lot of carbohydrates to gain weight because, uh, uh, you know, fat, for example, is nine calories a gram. Mm -hmm. two, two spoons of fat is like four spoons or five spoons of carbs. So, uh, it, you know, so, uh, animals, uh, you know, know that fat is a major source of calories, but fat alone doesn't really, uh, affect weight regulation very well. And so, uh, if, for example, when we, we did a study where we gave lard to rats and the rats didn't gain any weight at all because they were leptin sensitive. So they just, you know, they just ate the amount of lard they needed. But we then did a study where we gave them fructose first. And after several months, they became leptin resistant, which we could prove by actually injecting leptin and proving it. But they weren't very fat either because they were pretty much on a carb diet, which it by itself doesn't really cause obesity. Mm -hmm. It just makes them hungry. So then we did that really cool thing. We took away the carbs and gave them high fat. Now we give them the lard back. Before they wouldn't get fat on the lard, but now I've made them leptin resistance from the fructose. And now when they get the lard, they gain weight dramatically. Mm -hmm. But they're not eating fructose at that time. They're just leptin resistant mm -hmm. from the fructose. And that will last for several weeks. You know, mm -hmm. after, you, so, so for example, if I wanted to make, um, if I wanted to try to prove that high fat was bad, 
you know, I would take people who are high on sugar, are already leptin resistant, and then uh, I give them fat versus carbs. And for the same, you know, in an ad lib condition, you're going to gain more. F- if you're hungry because you're leptin resistant, you're going to gain more fat quickly if you're eating a high fat diet than a high carb diet, right? Because you're leptin resistant already from the sugar. So now give them the fat and boom. So like in, in American culture, what happens is we're eating sugar, but we're also eating a lot of fat. So the sugar and the fructose kind of triggers the leptin resistance. But then what drives that massive obesity is the high fat diet. It's like making a fire with the fructose and then putting on the wood, which is the mm-hmm. high fat. The wood alone won't cause the fat, the, the fire, but the wood will make the fire really big. So like if you look in Japan, uh, there, where there's not as much high fat in the diet, the uh, metabolic syndrome there, the people aren't as fat. They don't have that massive obesity unless, of course, they have a source to, you know, to get the high fat. So the yeah. real problem seems to be the standard American, standard Western diet where you are getting a lot of these uh, refined sugars, particularly fructose, and a high amount of, of fat. Yes. Is that is that why, or I guess asked another way, how do you – how do you think about a high quality? So let's push the standard Western diet to the side for a moment. Would you expect to see a difference between a high quality, low carbohydrate diet and a high quality, high carbohydrate diet, like in the diet fit study, where presumably in the high carb group, and I haven't gone into the details, I'm not sure in the supplementary information if they even have this, but presumably in the high carb um, and I'd have to ask Dr. Gardner, but I presume they're eating more fruit at least. Um, but yeah. once you've removed all of these ultra processed foods and refined sugars, are you saying that in, in, in that instance, you would expect there not to be much difference in terms of weight loss or were you surprised by diet fits? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, just to, you know, to make a real key point, if you're on a low carb diet, you and you are become leptin sensitive, which takes about two weeks. And that, you know, remember most low carb diets, they do very severe carb restriction for two weeks. So you low carb diet, um, and you're leptin sensitive. That's why you can be on a high fat, low carb diet and, and lose weight because the high fat is not, um, you know, you're, you're, you're regulating your weight. Now, it, the, what drives the, uh, fat switch, is seems to be fructose for the most part or foods that raise uric acid and in, in, among carbs the main f- f- carbs that raise fructose are uh you know like uh table sugar and high fructose corn syrup and then fruits can do it too but what it, what's incredible about fruits is that uh, the fruits we eat tend to have just a small amount of fructose like uh four grams or six grams of fructose. And my uh, my collaborator, Josh Rabinowitz, did this beautiful study where he showed that uh, when, when, a, uh, when an animal eats fructose, the first few grams is like in a human, it would probably be about the equivalent of one or two fruit, gets inactivated in the gut. And so it doesn't activate the switch in the liver. It gets removed through when it gets into the gut. So you really have to eat probably more than eight grams of fructose at a, at a one setting to activate the switch. How much fruit would that be? Well, for example, like, uh, 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 you, you, like an orange is about six grams. You, and so if you ate an orange, you probably are not going to activate the switch. If you ate four Mm -hmm. of them, yes, you would. Mm -hmm. Uh, if an apple has like eight to 10 grams, so if you ate it really fast or if you made it into apple juice, by gosh, you would really uh, get, you'd activate the switch. But, but you know, but the first five or six grams are inactivated. But here's another thing. Fruits also get, uh, it's, rem- it's the concentration of fructose that triggers the switch. You know, the higher the concentration, the greater the switch activation, because the, it's all about how much that ATP level falls. And so it's how rapidly and how much fructose gets there. So when you drink a soft drink and you're drinking 32 grams of fructose, 
in, in two minutes, you're going to activate the switch big time, especially on an empty stomach. And we did a study where we gave apple juice either slow or, or fast. And if you drink it fast, you activate the switch much stronger. But natural fruits have fiber. So they're slow. You know, when you eat all that with the fiber, the fructose is released slowly. And there's other things in fruit that tend to block fructose. This is the vitamin C and the flavanols and the quercetin mm-hmm. and things like that, that kind of counter the effects of the fructose. But, at, you know, for animals in the wild, they'll wait for the fruit to ripen. And as the fruit ripens, the sugar content goes up, the vitamin C content goes down. And so they're, they're maximizing the fructose they get from the fruit. We tend to like tart fruit and we tend to eat small amounts of fruit. And I actually did a clinical trial with a low fructose diet where you were allowed to add back natural fruits and that group did just as well as the uh, low fructose group alone. So natural fruits are mm-hmm. good. Uh, you know, eat your natural fruits. I'm not anti fruit. You know, I love natural fruits, but fruit juices got to be a little careful. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, not all fruit juice, not all fruit juices are the same. And there's some fruits like lemon and lime and kiwi that have very little sugar. Um, and so, you know, there's all, there's, you know, you have to understand what, how much fructose is. In it. Hey friends, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. A quick message from one of our sponsors who makes this show possible, and then we'll jump straight back into things. If you're familiar with my nutrition philosophy, you will know that I'm a huge believer in plant-rich diets being better for people and our planet. You'll also know that I frequently draw attention to what I describe as nutrients of focus. These are nutrients that science shows plant-based eaters, whether plant predominant or exclusive, can fall short in, which can leave you feeling run down, lacking energy, experiencing brain fog, and generally just not as vital as you'd like to be. For that reason, together with Emil, a plant-based health and wellness company, I formulated Essential 8. Essential 8 is your one-stop multinutrient, formulated with DHA, EPA, Omega-3s from algae oil, vitamin B12, iodine, vitamin D3, iron, zinc, selenium, and calcium to perfectly complement your plant-rich diet. I personally take Essential 8 every morning with breakfast, just two capsules, much easier than supplementing with these eight key nutrients individually. What's even more convenient is I have a monthly subscription, so it turns up automatically on my doorstep and I never miss a beat. To get yours, head to theproof.com forward slash friends. That's theproof.com forward slash friends, where you'll find a link to purchase Essential 8 that will get you an extra 5% off your first order on top of the significant subscription discount. There will also be a link to this in the show notes. Okay, back to the show. I want to come back to that earlier question we had about sort of disentangling excess calories versus in the independent effect of, of fructose. Um, and, with, and then that might lead us into thinking about fruitarians. Um, but there, yeah. there was a nat- Nature Reviews article, and I think I sent it over to you. I'm not sure if, if you'd seen it or if you've had time, but I'll, I'll briefly just describe. It was a review looking at uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and they seem to, to conclude that based on human intervention studies, when fructose or other added sugars are added to the diet in eucaloric um, conditions, so without an excess of calories, there, there doesn't seem to be an increase in, in liver fat. Um, but in contrast with, with, uh, diets rich in saturated fat in eucaloric conditions, they did see an increase in liver fat. Um, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on, on that evidence and how that kind of, how we reconcile that with this idea that, that fructose can have, uh, there can be metabolic consequences without an excess of energy. Well, I got to tell you, I've studied um, so many, uh, including in patients as well as in animals, and, and fructose is the most magnificent way to induce fatty liver. Um, and when we looked at biopsies of patients with fatty liver, we found evidence for elevated fructose metabolism in the liver. And what's more, we, we showed that it was associated with high uric acid. And we published a series of people 
uh, of cases of fatty liver where the patients uh, were all skinny, but they had the high uric acid. Uh, these were dialysis patients. And we, we can create, and I think I told you how I created fatty liver in animals by dieting them with low, low uh, fruit, I mean, with a high fructose, low calorie diet. So uh, I, I know that fructose is a major driver of fatty liver. We can show the enzymes are there. Uh, and so the real question is, why are they getting these results? You know, when there's all, and, and there's data showing that the keto diet, uh, I have a whole series of studies I can send you uh, that a keto diet can really help reduce uh, fat in the liver. But let me tell you uh, a very basic principle. And the basic principle is if you become fat, if you, if we do anything to increase your, your, your fat, the fat isn't going to just go to the adipose. You're going to get some fat in the liver and you're going to get some fat in the blood. And so when there are studies involving high fat diets, what you have to do is you have to look at, remember that high fat is a calorie and you get, and uh, that high fat diets tend, will tend to cause more weight gain if you're leptin resistant than if you're not. If you're a fructarian and you're hungry because you've activated this switch, but you're eating mainly carbs, you may not have enough calories to actually get to that high fat to become really fat. But if you're leptin resistant and you're eating a high fat diet, you're gonna gain weight much more. And likewise, if you are fat and you go on a low fat diet versus a low carb diet, in, in general, the, you you will see acutely a reduction more in weight in the low fat group, but but it, you know it's very hard. You know when you say um, isocaloric, uh, you know we 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 really have to kind of separate out. You know take a look at each study individually to mm -hmm. see if we can explain it, and and usually I can explain it when you start looking at it carefully. You know you can see what's happening. But um, you've got to remember that fat is the is the firewood, and so it, it can drive more fat and it can reduce more fat uh, acutely. But it's really uh, contingent on the long term on on what's regulating your weight gain. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the the overall regulation of weight becomes a lot more important in the long term. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway. So would you expect with, with fruitarians though, because they would have quite a substantial amount of fructose in their diet, right? So I understand what you're saying that they may not be consuming enough total calories for it to show up in terms of excessive adiposity. But going back to what you said earlier, this idea that fructose can have, uh, there can be metabolic consequences independent of weight. Would you expect if you looked under the hood, at, at, at fruitarians and looked at their metabolic health that you would see some, some problematic, would there be some problematic findings of whether it's insulin resistance or liver fat? What, what would you kind of predict or has that been looked at? Well, it would really depend upon the individual and how, what kinds of fruits they're eating. So it turns, remember that I told you that, um, so there's this really interesting finding, Simon, which is that, um, you know, uh, the plants, when they, when the fruits are, are forming, they don't want the animal, if, if, if plants could think, they wouldn't want the animal to eat the fruit until the fruit is, until the seeds, seeds are mature. Mm -hmm. Because the, when the seeds are mature, then when the animal eats the fruit, uh, it will disperse the seeds and, and, and allow more fruit trees to happen. So in this kind of principle of evolution, um, the fruit is the, the, the tree would like, I mean, the trees don't think, but the trees would prefer, of course, for the fruit to be eaten when it's mature so that the seeds can disperse. So what happens is the fruits, uh, get, have this sugar that animals want to eat so that they can store fat. And animals have sweet receptors and they're searching for these foods. And the fruit, the sugar content goes up as the fruits ripen and all these good things in it, like, um, you know, uh, flavanols mm -hmm. 
-hmm. vitamin C and all these things, they tend to go down as the fruit ripens. Those substances actually counter the effects of fructose. So if a plant, I mean, if an animal eats a immature fruit, they're not going to really gain any fat from it because the quercetin and flavanols and epicatechin uh, and all these things that are in it and vitamin C actually help neutralize the switch to some extent. And so what happens is, uh, you know, depending on what kind of fruit you're eating, if you're eating a kiwi that's high in vitamin C and has very little sugar, you're never going to get fat from eating kiwi. If you're eating, uh, you know, tons of apples, pears, and plums that have a higher sugar content and less good things, you, you probably are going to develop some insulin resistance. But, but fruit really has a lot of good things in it. Um, we did this study, uh, I talk about in the book. I, I actually haven't published it yet, but it's a pretty cool study. Um, we knew that vitamin C, uh, is an antioxidant, right? And remember the way uric acid works. It's a oxidant. It's actually inducing oxidative stress to the energy factories. And vitamin C kind of blocks that oxidative stress to the energy factors. Mm -hmm. So there's actually data in the literature that vitamin C can actually counter some effects of metabolic syndrome. It can improve insulin resistance mm -hmm. a little bit, improve blood pressure and all those kinds of things. Well, vitamin C is in fruit, but it's, it's, in, it's high in the fruit in the early part of the season. And then it goes down as the fruit ripens. But it sort of counters the effects of, of, um, of the fructose. So what we did is, you know, humans, um, uh, are vitamin C deficient. And, uh, so we took animals that were vitamin C deficient. We, we had these, uh, laboratory mice that were vitamin C deficient and, and they're going to get scurvy if we don't give them some vitamin C. So we gave them all a little bit of vitamin C so that they were okay. But now we had, they only had low blood concentrations of vitamin C sort of like people with obesity have low concentrations of vitamin C, okay? And then what we did is one group got a high dose of vitamin C, one group got the low dose. So the only difference was the high dose had a higher level of vitamin C. Now we feed them both sugar. We give them high fructose corn syrup. Both drank exactly the same amount, but the group that had the high concentrations of vitamin C got much less fat. So the vitamin C was countering the obesity. So the bottom line is if you're a fructarian, and you're eating a fair amount of vitamin C and you've got flavanols and epicatechin and quercetin and fiber and potassium, uh, you know, you may be, you may do fairly well. But if you're eating the wrong kinds of fruit that's particularly sweet and you're mm -hmm. juicing it, <laughs> you're going to get into trouble. Uh, and so, um, yeah. Is there a, a particular study? that you would like to see funded potentially with humans uh, that that may help shed more light on all of these things we're talking about. If you had the NIH support and you had as much money as you needed, what what study would you design that you think would help you further understand this pathway and then also help um, some of your uh, colleagues who may be uh, you know, a little bit skeptical, yeah. uh, believe so, more in this model. So what I would do is I try to find David Ludwig and, and Rob Lustig and Kevin Hall, and mm -hmm. I would meet with them all. And I would design a study that would, uh, would test all these hypotheses because they all have elements of truth. They're all mm -hmm. good hypotheses. But I think what we're lucky about is that we've identified a pathway that can explain all these things. And, and so the, I dream, the, the dream would be to work together and to de design it. And I, actually, I, there's going to be, I'm going to be at an obesity meeting with these individuals, mm -hmm. uh, in October. And I'm hoping that, that I can do that. I do. Yeah. There is one really big area that we haven't talked about that is really important. And, um, I just want to bring it up, uh, be, before the interview ends. And that is, you know, so everything that we've talked about so far has really been focused on fructose, which is the fructose that we're eating. Mm -hmm. And the fructose we're eating from fruits and juices and sugar and so forth. And, and when I started off doing this research <laughs> 25 years ago, I, I honestly thought it was all fructose and that, and, uh, you know, I was worried about purine foods too. 
But uh, but I really thought of the carbs as being the problem with fructose. And I didn't think that, but I had a problem. And the problem I had was that I knew French fries weren't, weren't healthy, <laughs> but French fries don't have fructose in them. They're starch. They have glucose. Starch is glucose. And they have they have fat and they have salt. And and so the question was, you know, uh, is there something else? And uh, we had a very big discovery in our laboratory, uh, which was that um, it had been known that the body can make fructose from glucose. But honestly, everybody, no one thought that was important. And what we discovered was that certain foods get con- will generate a fair amount of fructose in the body. So it's not about just eating fructose, the body can make fructose. And the main way it makes it is from carbs. Fructose is made from glucose. And so, uh, but the gluc, in order for that to happen, you have to have a lot of glucose. And, and, and the best way to get a lot of glucose, especially high concentrations of glucose, is to eat high glycemic carbs. What you were talking about is poor quality carbs, like white rice, potatoes, uh, cereal, French fries, you know, all this kind of starchy foods that release a lot of glucose in the blood. And this is, you know, this goes to D- Ludwig's theory and Lustig's theory and uh, Gary Tobbs and they're wonderful si- um, scientists. And what they say is, hey, you know, the problem is when you're eating carbs, the glucose goes up in the blood and it stimulates mm-hmm. insulin and that's what drives obesity. But it turns out that when the glucose goes up, it stimulates insulin, but it also stimulates mm. fructose production. And we did this wonderful, got a great experiment where we took animals and we fed them glucose and we could show that they were making fructose and that they got really fat from the fructose. And when we blocked um, the fructose metabolism, they still got a little bit of fat, but it was a healthy fat. They weren't insulin mm. resistant. They weren't, uh, they didn't have fatty liver, it would, but they did have a little bit of weight gain. And that was from the insulin. But, mm. but the fructose was what was driving the survival switch, the insulin resistance, the fatty liver, the increased triglycerides, the increased blood pressure. So, um, so to get back to your, to your point, um, glucose tends to have two sides to it. One side is it stimulates insulin. Uh, and makes more of a healthy fat. And it's actually more in the subcutaneous. And, you know, it's been shown to be, you know, it's a good fat. But uh, gl- when glucose gets converted to fructose, that's when you activate this switch. Hmm. Can I ask you a couple questions yeah. on this? And I, sure. I, I feel like I, I feel like I'm pushing back on a few things, but <laughs> yeah, well, let's do I, it. I've, let's... I've loved your book. I love your research. I think this is fascinating. And I, I know that you can handle a little bit of pushback because you are a career scientist. So, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put these things forward if I didn't think you could handle it. So the one thing if, with, with that and with, uh, with, uh, Ludwig and Taub's work and, and they've done a, a lot of, a lot of work. Um, and, They've, you know, published about the carbohydrate, carbohydrate insulin model. The one thing that I just find hard to reconcile, and I keep coming back to it, is these studies like diet fits, you know, and there's probably folks listening thinking, are, are potatoes, you know, really, you know, they're starch? Are they really driving obesity? Um, and I know you mentioned before that this, the, the lethal combination of high refined sugars and saturated fat. And I want to kind of come back to that. Is that is that why we see populations like the Okinawans, for example, who eat a lot of sweet potato, they don't appear to be overweight or obese, they appear to be metabolically healthy and, and living quite impressively long lives. Is that why the high carb group in diet fits didn't gain a significant amount of 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 body weight more than the low carb group. How do we, how do we reconcile all of that? I would, uh, you know, um, what we should do is the following. You should send me the specific papers so that I can really go through them carefully so that I can mm-hmm. answer it in the best uh, possible sure. way. But I will say that, um, you know, things like uh, sweet potatoes, depending on how much you eat, you may, you may not activate the switch at all, even though there's a little fructose in it. 
um, it, it, you know, I don't think it's enough to, it will be inactivated in the gut. Um, you know, I, I, and so the Okinawans, if they're eating, you know, small amounts of sweet potatoes, that's not going to be enough. And I, I have the feeling that they're, they're not drinking soft drinks and they're not drinking no. fruit juice, uh, smoothies and, you know, so, um, so, but the other thing is that, um, the glycemic carbs, uh, you know, it takes a, a quite a while to turn on the enzymes that convert the glucose to fructose. So there's a specific enzyme and it's normally not in the liver. It's normally not expressed in many places at all. But in people who are over, overweight or people who have fatty liver, it's there in their liver and mm -hmm. uh, it gets turned on. And uh, it, although high glycemic carbs can turn it on, um, and they, and I'm sure that they're doing it these, when the glucose goes up and you're eating a lot of like a, something that really triggers it, uh, the easiest way to turn it on is not by high glycemic carbs. It's by salt. And when you mm -hmm. eat salt, it increases the osmolarity in the blood and that triggers or the salt concentration of the blood, and that triggers the production of this enzyme. So it turns out that salted French fries are dangerous, not just because of the French fry and the oil and the fat coating, which is obviously going to give you that cal caloric punch, but the salt is very, very critical because that really primes the conversion of that potato to fructose. Mm -hmm. So this is so salty food. So we did studies and you wouldn't, you wouldn't expect it. You would think, you know, salt's got no calories. How can salt cause obesity? But you'll be surprised. Most people who are obese are eating a lot of salty foods. And most people who are obese tend to actually sh show signs of a high salt concentration in their blood. And that causes thirst and dehydration. And so, um, and that activates the switch. So we can actually activate the switch by uh, dehydrating an animal, but they have to get carbs to really turn it into fat. So if you mm -hmm. just get, if you're dehydrated and you don't have carbs that you're, you're taking, you're not going to be, um, able to convert it to fructose. Mm -hmm. But if you are, so, so it's sort of interesting. So to get to your point, um, uh, not all carbs are the same. You know, part of it is, you know, how well they raise glucose, how much glucose they release. And a part of it is what else you're eating. If you're eating a mm -hmm. lot of salt with it, you're going to be more likely to convert. You know, back in Ireland in the 1800s, there were, you know, potatoes made up 90% of the diet, but obesity was extremely rare. So it isn't just the high glycemic carb. There's probably other things that kind of fit with it. You know, you have to have the salt and then fructose itself isn't the thing that really makes you overweight. It's the fat you eat with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and fructose just sets, it sets off the switch. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so you can see, <laughs> yeah, no, you can I, see I, it's I kind of complicated. So when you look at these and, and so you get Kevin Hall publishes this paper and, and, and you go, Hey, that this it's it's just energy balance. Well, it is energy balance, but you know what? You know the the design of the study is expected to show that. And if you do the yeah. you know elastic study, and you put animals on or humans on low fructose diet, isochloric, and you show the fatty liver goes down, yeah, that's expected. Mm. You know, so um, <laughs> it kind of tells tells me though that there might be multiple avenues about of, of going about this if you're moving away from a standard western diet that's high in high glycemic carbohydrates is rich in in fructose and contains a lot of saturated fat you could veer off and go to a diet that is high carb but is not high in high glycemic carbohydrates is right. not rich in um you know um the added sugars and high fructose corn syrup or you could go to the low carbohydrate high fat yeah. diet yeah. but of a of a high diet yes. quality and i i think we do see that yeah play yeah. out in the research so and that yeah. would also explain why 
fruitarians might not be gaining as much weight as you would mm. otherwise suspect because yeah. I don't think they would have a whole lot of fat in their diet and right. the same could be said. The Okinawans, I'll send you a couple of papers, they, yeah. they, they do or the traditional diet does seem to be made up, like you said then, the Irish diet of a lot of potatoes, but it is a diet that's very low in total fat. So um, that might be uh, yeah. partly to explain why we don't see high rates of, of obesity in that population. I do have a question for you. We spoke about purines. And so you've now described there's this uh, polyol uh, pathway where you can convert uh, glucose into fructose endogenously in the body. There's also fructo fructose that can come directly in our diet. Right. I just want to piece together purines a little bit more. Um, so, so purines... Uh Purines can uh, generate uric acid because they're kind of these nitrogen products. And so that's another source. And we actually showed that you can activate the switch if you eat enough purines, which is really mm -hmm. was depressing. Um, and uh, it, it turns out that that's probably how shrimp and um, oysters and shellfish can cause obesity um, because they have these purines that can generate uric acid. Interestingly, the purines in vegetables uh, do not seem to do this, and it's because they, the, the actual purine content is low in the ones that are tend to be turned into uric acid. So, um, mm. the, you know, for the vegetarians, um, the purines really are not an issue. The, the biggest problem, uh, you know, is beer, though, in terms of the highest uh, risk because of the yeast extract. Mm. Uh, and then the alcohol also can be broken down to uric acid to some extent. too. So uh, anyway, uh, one of the things that I'll tell you is that what's great is that there you can design almost any diet. You can even I know you probably don't want to hear it, but even a carnivore diet can can uh, you, you can pick and choose to, you know, to eat where where you tend not to activate the switch. But I, I do agree with you. Uh, that of you know veg vegetarian diets and and diets high in plants um, are, are particularly attractive uh, and uh, and and especially if you can reduce uh, some of these uh, bad carbs versus mm -hmm. good carbs bad proteins versus good proteins and bad fats versus good fats. I wanted to ask you a quick question about the carnivore diet, and you know I think most people particularly listeners of this show and, and, and followers of folks online would understand that, you know, there are, there's enough people to have adopted the carnivore diet and seen at least short term benefits to, to understand that when you do shift, uh, away from, especially from a standard Western diet, but potentially from other diets to that style of diet, um, that people are experiencing benefits. I think yeah. I would sit on the side of being slightly skeptical as to, what the long-term risks are, but there hasn't been a lot of research on that dietary pattern. So I think, um, uh, I think we'd be speculating a lot either way. But one thing that I've noticed is recently this kind of, and, and I'm just thinking of this now as you describe foods that are rich in purines and you've spoken about honey um, and we've spoken about fruit. There seems to be this diet online that's sort of very, very carnivore. It's heavy on organs, and if I'm right, organs like liver <laughs> yeah. are very, very rich in right. purines, um, not to mention could contain toxic amounts of vitamin A and copper and other things. Yeah, but this, toxins. This, there's, this, there's this focus on uh, liver as a superfood, liver, 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 and then honey and fruit as an overall diet, and that sounds like a bit of a nightmare from activation of this switch that you're describing. Yeah, I would say um, the trouble with liver is that it tends to concentrate the chemicals and agrochemicals and toxins that the animal eats. So you you don't really know what you're getting, um, you know. But I, uh, it's also very high in fat. Uh, people who like you know foie gras, um, that that's typically fatty liver that's you know been made by feeding at force feeding animals. Uh, figs and dates and sugar and um, to make them get fatty liver. But liver um, is high in purines. It, it will should activate the switch. 
Um, I will say that, you know, the carnivore diet has some good things going for it, right? It's, you know, you're carb restricting for sure. So it's going to have a lot of benefits on keeping that switch turned off. And um, not not all foods, uh, you know, generate, not all meats generate a lot of uric acid. Some do, but, um, you know, it's mainly the processed meats uh, that mm-hmm. do it and uh, the organ meats and the shellfish. Um, and so, you know, um, so if there is someone who wants to do a carnivore diet, there's going to be a lot of potential benefits, but you, uh, you know, but, but there's a lot of benefits with the Mediterranean diet and so forth. And I discuss these different diets in my book. And, you know, every diet, there's always something good with a diet or it wouldn't be around. And, um, and there's always some, some setbacks with various diets too. And mm-hmm. I, I'm a kidney specialist. And so I see patients with kidney disease all the time. And one of the problems with a very high protein diet is that it can cause kidney disease to advance. So, um, uh, so that's, that's one setback. If you're eating a very high protein diet, uh, if you have kidney disease and there, there are a lot of people who have low grade kidney disease. So you have to be a little careful, but anyway, um, but there are good things with carnivore diets. There's good things with vegan diets. There's good things with, I like the Mediterranean diet a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and for me, I tend to want, I would like to see, you know, I, I think that we, there's a purpose where everybody, you know, humans were, were always eating some carbs, some proteins and some fat. So to completely restrict a whole class seems, you know, Mm -hmm. harsh. On the other hand, if you're trying to lose weight acutely, you know, like a low carb diet is very effective, uh, to help lose weight acutely. Um, you know, so, I mean, there's benefits with different approaches. <laughs> what is there a particular study that you would point people to that would support, um, this idea that low carb diets are particularly beneficial for, for weight loss over a high carb diet? I, you know, I understand that I guess initially people are going to see quite a bit of, um, weight loss on the scales with glycogen depletion and losing water. But is there any longer term studies that you think would suggest that low carb diets are better than high carb diets for weight loss? Okay. So, so remember that, um, c- when you do caloric restriction, it doesn't matter what diet it is in terms of weight loss. So, you know, if you, I'm going to publish in the New England Journal that, you know, this caloric restricted diet that's restricting more fat and this one's restricting c- c- carbs. If you're on a diet caloric restriction, um, and everyone's kind of trying to reduce the calories the same amount, the weight loss is going to be the same. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, um, but what happens is that, is that when you restrict, when you can, to pick a diet that turns off this switch is going to start improving other things like the metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance and hypertriglyceridemia and all those things. So when you look at a study, first determine, is it caloric restriction or not? And is it isocaloric? Uh, and if it's isocaloric and they say there's no difference in weight, just smile because you know, sure. that's the classic trick, you know, yeah. uh, it's not, you know, uh, but look at the metabolic parameters. Okay. Mm-hmm. Just do that. And if it's not caloric restricted, it's ad libidum. That's really the way that in some respects we'd like to be, you know, no one wants to have to restrict the calories that they would like to eat. And one of the things that's been shown again and again and again, is that a low carb diet tends to um, naturally reduce the amount of food you eat. Uh, and it's because it's improving your ability to regulate weight. Um, you'll never see a low fat. I don't think Simon challenged me on this. I don't think there's ever been a low fat diet that's been given that, that without caloric restriction, because you can't, because they're still on the high carb. No, there, there, there's, 
I'll, I'll push back a little. I'm going to send you these two studies and then we can reconvene in, yeah. in another episode. But so the, the Kevin Hall study that I was referring to, and I think you're going to, you'll, you'll say this is too short term, but his study, and that was just, uh, uh, I think it was a two, it might have been a four week, um, where the subjects crossover trial, they did a low fat, high carb plant based diet for two weeks. And they also did a high, uh, high fat, um, low carb ketogenic diet. But wasn't, weren't they both re- caloric restricted? I'm pretty sure they were caloric no, restricted. I don't believe they were caloric restricted. They were, that was an ad lib study, if I'm correct. And the, on the plant based diet, those folks ate approximately 700 calories less per day, oh, I want to say. Um, but that was a short term study. And I'll dig that up. I'll send it over. Yes, and send we can it go to me. That. Let me. And let then me. the other one that was definitely ad lib was diet fits. That was a real world um, study where Chris Gardner had dietitians help folks that were randomized to low carb or high carb. Dietitians worked with them to make sure they were doing it in a high quality dietary pattern way, whichever um, right. um, they were randomized to. And there was no significant difference in weight loss over the year. And I believe there was no significant difference in satiety, but I'd have to check that. But if, if, if it was high quality carbs, they were probably restricting the sugar, high fructose mm-hmm. corn syrup, uh, French fries. You know, it wasn't the classic, sure. uh, high and carb, I think, that high carb diet. Yeah. I doubt it involved a lot of sugar and, and French fries. Okay. Uh, I think most people, <laughs> I think most people are, are in agreement there that those carbs are not great. I think where the disagreement is, is that some folks will say if it's high quality carbohydrates from whole plant foods, that when you look at that dietary pattern versus a low carb, high fat diet, there doesn't appear to be a difference in weight loss or satiety. I think that's where the current disagreement right. lies. Okay. Well, if just think about this, Aaron. if you're eating high quality plants, uh, carbs where the carbs are, are, you know, you're not releasing a lot of glucose, they're low glycemic. They're not going to activate the switch. That's going to be a very healthy food. You know, a high, mm-hmm. a low glycemic carb or a high quality carb diet. That's going to be very good quality food. And, and, and if you match it with a high fat diet, the high carb diet is, you know, uh, the, 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 you know, the high carb diet was going to do better than the high fat. And if you do low fat and low carb, then the, the low fat will do better, right? Because, uh, you know, because you're cutting out the bad, bad, bad guys. Actually, I may have said that wrong, but, <laughs> but, what, the, but, but, but the bottom line is that it isn't just carbs versus fat. It's mm-hmm. what kind of fat and it's what kind of carbs. If you, if you eat an omega-3 enriched di- uh, diet, the omega-3 actually counters fructose effects. If you, you know, if you, if monosaturated fat appears to be fairly safe, like olive oil based diets, um, whereas these, uh, you know, other types of fats may be worse. So it, it isn't just high fat versus high carb. It's the quality of the carbs and the quality of the fat. Mm-hmm. And so we have to look at all that. Okay. I, let me, I'm let me happy summarize. To do that with you. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think we come back for round two. We get some questions from the community and, um, I'm having fun with this. I hope you are too. We can, yeah, I am. we can, we can keep the combo going. Um, so let me just summarize things here and then we can kind of, um, hear a little bit of a summary from you. And, uh, we can reconvene in part two. So if we, if we sort of come back to this idea of, of the obesity rates today, um, you say in, in your book that, that in nature, fat is a survival tool. And what you've explained through this conversation is that there is a survival benefit to becoming insulin resistant. So short of us, uh, indulging and then going into long periods of famine like animals in the wild, um, we have to adjust our dietary pattern to, to try and limit the activation of this survival pathway, limit insulin resistance and fat deposition. 
and what you've described is, from a, an individual point of view is looking to a dietary pattern that is based on whole foods. It's reducing exposure to high purine, purine foods, to fructose, especially high fructose corn syrup, added sugars or foods with added sugars. Um, you mentioned as well alcohol. That's one of those purine rich uh, foods. You spoke about the benefits of having a, a good amount of vitamin C in your diet and, and you speak about that further in your book and, and also about the deleterious effects of, of a high salt diet. Um, would that be a, a fairly good yeah. broad summary of, of uh, your position? Yes. I, I mean, there is another t- uh, section we should talk about next time, which is that um, th- what we're talking about is how you initiate the switch. But when it's been turned on for a long time, you start getting that damage to those mitochondria. And when there's a sufficient damage, then the, the, some of the, these problems will persist even when you stop activating the switch. So mm-hmm. we have to actually learn how to uh, rejuvenate our mitochondria and recover them. And it did. so what we've been talking about today is, you know, how you activate this switch to become overweight. But when you've been obese for a very long time, you can kind of get locked in because you've kind of damaged your mitochondria. So th- that's a whole another section we should just talk about mm-hmm. later. But the, but the bottom line is you can actually do things to help block the switch, which, uh, you know, by picking wisely on your foods, and then we have to also, in people who've been chronically overweight, we have to do things to rejuvenate those energy factories to give you back your energy again. And there are ways to do it. So it's it, the science is uh, you know becoming more and more clear. So it, you know, it, so it's one thing <laughs> that we 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 didn't touch on on saturated fat too yeah. much, but just quickly, I know in in your book. You, you mentioned to choose poultry and plant protein over red meat. Is that mainly because of the purines and the saturated fat or is that for other reasons? Uh, I think it's mainly for the purines. Um, it seems like red meat, um, you know, also red meat tent may be a little more iron rich and, but, uh, but I, I think that red meats, um, there's a lot of good things about red meats too. I know there's a lot of people out there who really feel strongly that red meat's good and grass fed uh, beef, for example, has better types of fats in the meat. Uh, it's a complicated subject, but um, you know, based upon uh, my, my belief, we believe uh, that the red meat has, is a little bit more purine rich. And for example, there's um uh, a study we're doing in, in wild cats in these safari parks because they're developing kidney disease. And we think it's from the type of red meats that they're being fed. So we're actually doing a, a clinical study comparing where we feed some of the cats red meats versus white meats. So we'll try to get more science behind it. But, um, but I, I'm really against processed red meats uh, more than mm-hmm. I'm against regular red meats. <laughs> so that's that's uh, a lot of great information for individuals. <laughs> I'm curious to think to to hear from you on what you think about our governments and and the sort of food environment at, at large. Do you think that we can we could solve the obesity crisis with say blood glucose monitors and books and podcasts and just education in general, or does the food environment have to shift in such a way that the everyday person who's not listening to podcasts just happens to eat in a way that is naturally good for their metabolic health? I think we're going to have to do both. And, um, you know, if you take an animal and we've done this and you knock out the sweet receptor so they can't taste sugar, they'll still seek out sugar and uh, they'll still get fat from it. So um, I will tell you that uh, this desire for sugar is really metabolic. It's this switch is a metabolic switch. And, you know, if you put a little bit of sugar into food where you can barely taste it, you're going to like it. And it's a classic trick to, you know, the food industry to put a little bit of sugar to just provide bare sweetness that maybe you can't even taste it, but you'll want to go back for it. 
And uh, so I think we're going to have to, it's more than education. It's going to require working with the industry and also breakthroughs in medicine. I do believe what breakthroughs in medicine will have a big play in helping to, to stop mm-hmm. this. So yeah, let's add that to the list for, for next episode. <laughs> yeah, okay. We can, we also <laughs> didn't, we didn't get into the thrifty gene hypothesis. Oh, I love which, the thrifty gene. Yeah. Let's do that next time. We'll save that. Um, but if someone's listening, you mentioned food industry then, and let's say that they are a manufacturer or they're thinking about bringing out a food product and now they're kind of um, thinking about their formulation or the ingredients that they use. Um, are there any sweeteners that are better than others? For example, non-caloric or low-calorie sweet sweeteners like stevia and monk fruit, would they be preferable to others? Yeah, I, I do think stevia and monk fruit are, are superior. Uh, I also, um, you know, I, I think I'm a little concerned about most artificial sugars. Um, and you know, it's, let's talk about it next time, really, because it's a big topic. But, um, but I think stevia, uh, and monk fruit are relatively good. I think sucralose, um, uh, probably is safe the way it's being used, but, um, uh, you know, I think all artificial sugars we should be trying to limit to some extent. Um, there are other ones. Um, allulose is a new one that's become pretty popular. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to talk about them. I'm mm-hmm. not, I'm not really a super expert on them, but I, you know, I, I, I've done some studies with artificial sugars. Okay. We can save that for, yeah. for next episode yeah, as well. Let's do it. And the, the last question that I have for you that I think will will help round this out nicely, if someone's listening and thinking, gosh, I'd love to know if I'm metabolically healthy, and you've mentioned uric acid, and I know that you recommend getting uric acid levels tested, so I'm interested in what does that look like, what's a healthy uric acid level, and are there any other routine tests be it blood tests or things like liver fat that you would recommend someone does as a bit of an audit to work out, are they metabolically healthy? So I would look at all the classic features of the metabolic syndrome, you know, fasting, triglycerides, cholesterol, you know, HDL, LDL, cholesterol, uh, blood pressure, weight, uh, hemoglobin A1C, all the kind of classic tests that we use to look for metabolic syndrome. Uh, that would be one thing I would look at, you know, uh, your body fat percentage, but you, serum uric acid should be included in the list. And mm-hmm. if your uric acid is under six milligrams per deciliter, uh, which is about 360 micromolar, um, you know, I think that that is a good sign for you if it's under six. Uh, if it's around four milligrams per deciliter, it's even better. Um, I also think that things like high sensitivity C reactive protein is a good thing to measure. Um, and because it kind of measures systemic inflammation, which can be a sign, you know, that there's, um, you know, something going on and, and that you may not be as healthy as you think. Great. Richard, this has been super interesting. I'm, I'm almost certain that I've finished up here with more questions than I started <laughs> with. I, I've, I've had an explosion of things running through my mind, but I think this is, uh, I'm conscious of your, your, your time yeah. and I know it's getting late into yeah, your evening I'm there. Tired. So, <laughs> so let's, let's land the plane here yeah. and hopefully we pick up this conversation yeah. sometime soon. And um, send me these papers and I'll go through them. I, some of them are challenging. I totally agree. They're, hmm. uh, some of the Kevin Hall papers are a little bit challenging, but, um, mm-hmm. uh, but I need to, to go through them carefully and, and see if we can understand them. Um, yeah, I think that I, would be good. Yeah. There's, you know, often there's, there's bickering on Twitter, but I think the, the more sensible approach. Yeah. Send me the Gardner paper. To get the too. studies. Yeah. Send I'll send you the diet fits paper. Um, and, we will reconvene yeah. and we can discuss, discuss yeah. the ins and outs. Yeah. Um, and, 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 uh, and then a very important thing uh, is to realize that, you know, I'm telling you what I've learned from the research I've done. It doesn't mean that, uh, that I'm always, you know, that I'm right. I, it's based on my interpretation of the mm-hmm. research I've done. And so uh, I'm always willing to learn more. So if you can show me things that, um, 
you know, challenge the hypothesis. It's all for the better good because it will make us do more studies to get closer to the truth. Spoken like a true scientist. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. You uh, Thank con- you, congr- Congratulations again on the book, Nature Wants Us to Be Fat. I'll put a, a link to that into the show notes. Oh, that's great. Along, along with a link to uh, your Twitter and, and uh, where perfect. people can find you online. So yeah, that's thanks perfect. again. Thank you. It's been a- yeah, take care, my friend. It was a great interview. You're very knowledgeable. It's really terrific. It's unbelievable. Thank you Thank so you. much for we'll chat for, again soon. You bet. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you for joining me for this episode and your interest in science based conversation. I hope you enjoyed it and found the information covered interesting and instructive. If you did and you'd like to show your support for the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can stay up to date with new episodes and watch them in video format. Yes, the full length videos. Please also consider subscribing to the show on the Spotify and or Apple podcast app, wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts. You can also leave a review on Apple or Spotify. Again, a great way to support the show and make our content more discoverable for others to enjoy and learn from. If you have any comments about the episodes, suggestions for future episodes, including guests you'd like to see on the show, or questions that you'd like to have answered, please leave those in the comments section on YouTube. I myself and my team will take note of these comments when planning future episodes. Finally, the best way to support the show and receive discounts on products we love is by checking out our sponsors at theproof.com forward slash friends. Enjoy your week, stay well, and I look forward to catching you in the next episode.